Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone in our audience, wherever you happen to be in the world. I'm Doug Sullivan, president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and I want to thank you for joining us today for our special program to discuss the recently published book, A Political Economy of Free Zones in the Gulf Arab States, by AGSIW senior resident scholar, Dr. Robert Mogulnicki. Free zones are not a new phenomenon in the Middle East or in the Gulf. On one of my early visits to the Gulf in the 1990s, I went to Dubai and visited the huge Jebel Ali port, the world's largest man-made harbor, and the relatively new Jebel Ali free zone, which has since become the largest free zone in the world. Since then, free zones have sprung up in the UAE, across the Gulf, and across the region, almost like wildflowers. Why have Gulf governments created and promoted free zones? Today's program will give you some detailed answers and discussion about why, but over my career, a number of foreign officials have told me that they rely on free zones to promote economic development, trade and exports, job creation, and attract foreign investment, keeping all of that in a special area at arm's length from the country itself. Foreign countries in turn, uh, foreign companies in turn, have chosen to operate from free zones to take advantage of various incentives that ease doing business in these often very regulated economies. Again, at arm's length from the country itself and from any potential economic or political problems of that country. And while the region's free zones started decades ago as centers to promote trade and facilitate exports, they've since expanded to manufacturing, finance, high tech, and many other areas. Now, to help us unravel this phenomenon and the promise of free zones in the Gulf, we will turn to Dr. Robert Mogulnicki, senior resident scholar here at AGSIW. His new book, A Political Economy of Free Zones in the Gulf Arab States, was published this April by Paul Grave Macmillan's International Political Economy Series. Dr. Mogulnicki received his Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Oxford's Magdalen College and a Master's in Philosophy from St. Anthony's College at Oxford and a BA in Arabic and government from Georgetown University here in Washington, DC, where he graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. He has lived, worked, and conducted extensive research across the region, including in the UAE, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Turkey, and Jerusalem. And to cap it all, Dr. Mogadeki will be teaching a graduate level seminar on China Middle East relations as a professor at Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies this fall. Robert. Congratulations on the publication of your book and welcome to today's discussion. Uh, joining us today to discuss Robert's book, we have two very distinguished guests. Our discussant is Dr. Ziad Daoud, Chief Middle East Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Prior to joining Bloomberg, he was the head of economics at QNB Group and worked at Fulcrum Asset Management. He holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics and a BSc in economics and statistics from University College London. Dr. Daoud, welcome today. And our moderator for today's discussion is Dr. Sanam Vakil, Deputy Director of the Middle East North Africa Program at Chatham House. Her research focuses on regional security, Gulf geopolitics, and future trends in Iran's domestic and foreign policies. She is a lecturer in the Middle East Studies Department at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, Italy, someplace I've always wanted to go but never have been able to. Before that, she was uh, an assistant professor in the Middle East Studies program at uh, SAIS in Washington and a research associate at the Council on Foreign Relations, also providing analysis for the World Bank. Dr. Vakil received her PhD in international relations and international economics from the Johns Hopkins University and a BA and MA in political science and history from Barnard College, Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Vakil, welcome. And I'll hand you the virtual microphone to lead today's discussion. Thank you, Ambassador Silliman. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, we'll have to make sure to get you out to Bologna uh, as soon as we can all travel. Um, I'll put, it, put that on my to-do list. Um, it's a real pleasure to be a part of this discussion. Um, I am a big fan of Robert's book. It couldn't be more timely. Um, we just uh, witnessed an explosion just a few days ago at Dubai's Jebel Ali port, um, and uh, here we are uh, going to uh, 
think more deeply about free trade zones, uh, why they matter. Um, and I think Robert's contribution, um, and he really used a very unique sort of political economy approach to examine free trade zones as a phenomenon um, throughout the GCC, giving us you know, more insight on the UAE above all, sort of a harbinger of uh, free trade zones in the region. But I think his book is really interesting because he uses the prism of free trade zones to tell us much more um, about uh, GCC economies, um, their pathways uh, and sort of commitment to diversification and how free trade zones have um, been part of that process that he describes, I think, quite perfectly as messy and nonlinear. Um, but the diversification process um, that all of the GCC countries have uh, committed to um, bring, uh, bring to the fore challenges over um, labor laws, uh, foreign ownership, um, uh, interaction um, across the GCC states. Uh, really, uh, we have witnessed also competition um, among the GCC states as well, um, and how free trade zones have enabled the GCC states to uh, shift uh, towards Asia much more fluidly, um, as well as uh, broaden uh, their trade linkages uh, to uh, other uh, regional states, including Israel uh, and Iran. Uh, so there's much to unpack um, in this hour. Uh, I'm going to uh, pass the floor on to Robert, who is going to uh, make some introductory remarks. Uh, Ziad is, is also going to uh, comment um, as well. And then uh, we're going to open the floor to Q&A. Uh, looking forward to everybody's questions. Over to you, Robert. Great. Thank you so much, Sanam, and, and appreciate the opening remarks and introduction from Ambassador Silliman. And of course, it's nice to have Ziad here. I look forward to having a discussion with him uh, in just a short while. Um, I will also say you know, thanks to everybody who is joining. It's really, uh, it's really wonderful to have people supporting longer forms of scholarship, whether they be books or academic journals. I think uh, everyone could, could have more of those in their life uh, rather than less. So uh, you don't have to read my book per se, but uh, you know, other books uh, are, are very welcome. So thank you very much for joining. And uh, last but not least, I'll say that uh, I'm a little raspy today, coming off some type of allergy or cold. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, but let's uh, let's step back a little bit and and as a way of kicking off the conversation, look at some of the basics. I mean, the what, the when, the where, and the why of free zones. Because I think many people on this call and, and other um, and others who are familiar with the Gulf region will be familiar with the term free zone, but might not necessarily know exactly what it is or, or what purposes they accomplish. So for the most essential question really, what is a free zone? At least what are free zones as they appear in the Gulf? On a broad level, we can say that these are designated commercial areas with eased rules and regulations that are ultimately aimed to stimulate business activities. But there really isn't a universally accepted definition of free zones globally. So in the book and here today, I take some liberty to lay out three defining characteristics uh, of free zones, at least as I see them. And they revolve first around foreign ownership, second around labor regulations, and third around taxes and fees. On the first point of foreign ownership, what we see in free zones is the ability for foreign firms and foreign investors to maintain 100% foreign ownership of their venture, enterprise, or company. Uh, now, that's very different than outside of free zones in many cases. Sometimes we see foreign ownership being capped at 49%, for example. And then an investor has to find a local partner for the remaining 51%. And we see some variation there. But of course, being able to set up in free zones and maintain full ownership of your company or venture is a huge, huge uh, incentive for many of the firms and the investors to set up and register in free zones. So that's the first point. The second point has to do with labor regulations. And here, the labor regulations predominantly revolve around the ability of foreign firms or those registered in free zones to import as much expatriate labor as they want, or at least as much as permitted for their firm size and, and industry they operate in. Now, if you move outside of free zones, there are a number of different quotas, workforce nationalization policies, and other regulations that dictate how many local citizens need to be part of your workforce, how they need to be trained, and even how, whether, and if they can be uh, terminated. So 
the ability to um, constitute your local, your workforce with expatriate labor, as opposed to local citizens is another major incentive um, within gold free zones. And finally, the third point has to do with exemptions from taxes and other fees. And this actually gets a little bit more closely to the types of free zones and other special economic zones we see in the rest of the world. So we see exemptions for value added tax, exemptions from um, corporate income tax, and also exemptions from customs duties. So that's the, the third point gets us a little bit more closely to, um, to other entities that we see, comparable entities in the rest of the world. Moving on to the next point, I mean, or the next question, when were free zones uh, established and where do they actually appear in the Gulf? Well, Gulf governments lacking uh, substantial hydrocarbon resources tended to establish free zones earlier and in greater numbers. So for example, we saw free zones emerge in Dubai and the Northern Emirates as early as the 1980s. And the high concentration of free zones in these areas made the UAE the regional hub for free zones. As Sanam said, a lot of what my book talks about focuses on the UAE uh, because there are more than 40 operating free zones just within that one country. Now, on the other hand, governments with greater hydrocarbon resources, here I'm thinking about Qatar, uh, even Abu Dhabi, tended to establish free zones later in the 2000s. And in many cases, we saw those free zones that, were, that did emerge as having a more narrow uh, focus, focusing on niche industries, for example. In the remaining countries of the GCC, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, do also, some of these countries possess a handful of free zones. They tended to fall somewhere in between the two different extremes that I lay out, with free zones emerging in the 1990s and the 2000s, um, or in some cases, like in Saudi Arabia, you see the application of various free zone characteristics uh, being you know, integrated into various development initiatives and mega projects. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And finally, if I had to pinpoint a time that is a key area of growth for free zones in the region, we'd want to look at the year, the decade beginning in the year 2000, because this was not only the beginning of a very rapid period of growth across the region, but it was a key period for the proliferation of free zones as well. Dubai replicated successful free zone models, such as that um, connected to the Jebel Ali free zone, um, and created in its stead many different new free zone offerings. And other governments also, I would argue, sought to get in on the commercial, act, commercial action during that, um, during that very, very uh, busy and high growth decade. Where things get interesting is the following question. Why were free zones created in the first place and what purpose do they serve? Now, Ambassador Silliman mentioned a couple in his opening remarks, um, a few points about what the traditional objectives associated with free zones are. We see them being created to boost uh, exports in strategic sectors, to attract foreign direct investment, to generate employment, and also to create positive spillover effects. And if you speak to free zone officials across the region, the most common economic goal that they will, um, that they will say associated with their free zones is advancing economic diversification agendas as Sanam laid out as well, just a few moments ago. And all of these officials will admit that in order to meet, you know, to accomplish this aim, they need to provide an array of commercial incentives to firms and investors. All of these economic objectives certainly apply. Um, albeit to varying degrees across Gulf Arab uh, free zones. But the research and the findings in my book also emphasizes the political instrumentalization of free zones. So that is how free zones accomplish an array of political objectives in addition to the economic goals um, and plans and strategies connected to these free zones. I'll lay out a couple here just to for us to start thinking about and to get the conversation going. But some of these political objectives include reinforcing, uh, reinforcing commercial autonomy with, within federal government structures or also within regional frameworks. Sometimes free zones also have served as a reliable source of non-oil revenues for regional governments. In my book, I describe this revenue source as commercialized rents. And this is, by the way, not not uh, intended to be something that should be viewed as negative, but rather these non-oil revenues are in many cases uh, crucial for governments to engage in state building efforts. Free zones have also um, provided lucrative enterprises for politically connected individuals and 
and also you know business minded individuals. They offer a well paying and well respected jobs in many of the bureaucracies and authority and different authorities regula regulatory authorities connected to free zones. And you'll see many local citizens hold um, these positions. In some cases, they've served as pressure valves for regional governments as they navigate this messy process of economic and social reform. And finally here, this is not a comprehensive list, but we also see free zones um, being used as government entities at the forefront or the governments placing these entities at the forefront of new and sometimes controversial foreign policy agendas. This is certainly the case with UAE-Israel ties. So there are some who believe when they look at free zones and they look at the region and also um, look at free zone creation alongside a number of different ongoing commercial reforms that there are people who say, you know, look, these free zones certainly had a role to play over the last few decades, but there are ongoing commercial reforms that really, you know, diminish the importance of regional free zones. And there are some who will actually say that ongoing reforms in the region are actually an existential threat to free zones. I don't actually see things this way at all. Uh, it's true that there are reforms to foreign ownership taking place across the region. There are ongoing reforms to workforce nationalization. I'm not sure how long free zones will be able to allow their firms and investors to import you know, expatriates, an unfettered and uncontrolled amount of expatriates. And there are new taxes coming, uh, new tax regimes coming online every day. We have value added tax, potentially a future global uh, corporate income tax. All of these things are going to impact business operations in free zones. There's no doubt about that. However, regional governments have continued to launch new free zone initiatives, create new overseeing bodies, create new authorities, alongside the implementation of these very reforms going back the last few years. So we're not really seeing these reforms resulting in widespread closures of free zones. Actually, in some cases, the opposite is happening. Saudi Arabia has plans to launch 20 new economic zones. And most Gulf Arab governments are looking toward these existing trade and investment hubs as critical drivers of economic recovery um, from the coronavirus induced downturn. Now, I'll end by saying that the most recent move by Saudi Arabia to more strictly apply tariffs on goods uh, coming from regional free zones, which many observers, by the way, have described as a direct challenge to the UAE. This demonstrates the continued relevance of, of free zones for better or for worse in the region. And these entities are, are not only going to be important features of the regional framework within the Gulf, but also of any new bilateral trade agreements uh, that emerge in the future. So let me stop there. I think uh, hopefully that was a useful overview to kick off a conversation. And I'm really looking forward to what Ziad um, has to say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Robert, um, for that great introduction and overview. Um, we have a lot of uh, meat to dig into. I'm going to turn over to Ziad now, and, uh, and, and then we can uh, get back and circle back with some questions. Um, thank you, Sanam, and thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here. I think I was invited here because I work in the free zone, the Dubai International Financial Center, but I didn't stick to the script. I'm not talking from work, so I'm outside the free zone. So I hope I have something uh, to offer uh, and useful to say in, in my remarks. Um, let me start by congratulating Rob, uh, congratulating Rob on the book. Um, it's an excellent book. It, um, it provides a systemic analysis of free zones, not just in the UAE, but across the Gulf. It's got plenty of history, plenty of data, plenty of case studies and plenty of also theoretical foundations behind uh, free zones. And as the events of the recent days uh, have illustrated is also incredibly timely. Um, and it's an excellent uh, scholarly work. So uh, thank you, Rob, again for, for, for the book. What I want to discuss in my remarks is three things. Um, it's a question that uh, many people have discussed, why free zones? Um, I wanna talk about some success and failures of certain free zones. And I want to talk about the future of free zones in light of recent news. So why free zones? My interpretation of free zones is that they were created in order to generate growth in an environment where there is no oil, but you don't want to disrupt the social contract in the country. What does that mean? So you have a social contract in the GCC. 
roughly speaking, that says that the state offers citizens jobs, it provides protection for businesses through uh, local monopolies, through restrictions on foreign capital, and in return, there is limited political representation, at least in the traditional sense of the word. Now, this model is not conducive to growth, is not conducive to productivity, but it can sustain itself as long as there are petrodollars financing it. But when these dry up, I think this is when the concept of free zones um, was born. And as Rob documents in the book, it started in hydrocarbon scarce uh, places in the Gulf. Um, and it's the idea of, okay, let's create pockets where we can generate growth, where we can ease some of the restrictions uh, we can unleash some productivity without overhauling the social contract and the political economy of the whole country. And I think that's one reason why free zones were established and that's why they proliferated in hydrocarbon scarce entities like Dubai and like the Northern Emirates of the UAE. The second reason is the concept that Rob mentions in the book, commercialized rents. It provides an alternative rent to oil through fees that companies pay through by setting up in free zones, through rents they pay for renting uh, office space, uh, and that provides an alternative source of rent for the governments to fund themselves outside taxes. Um, and that's basically why free zones have happened, and now they're proliferating across the GCC. Now, um, the second thing I want to talk about is success and, and some success stories and some not so successful stories. So the biggest success stories, obviously, is the what Ambassador Salomon mentioned is Jebel Ali, uh, which was established, as again, Rob documents very well in the book, uh, in the 1980s. It, it was responsible for almost a third of the FDI coming into the UAE. It was res it's responsible for nearly a fifth of Dubai's GDP. And it's a dominant player in uh, the UAE's trade with its neighbors. Um, Rob quotes in the book, uh, Aisha Saleh Gorga, a prominent UAE government advisor and a former ambassador to the UK. And he said that Jebel Ali has contributed more than any other innovation to, uh, to Dubai and Dubai that we know today, today and it's a success. Um, and on the other hand, there is the sort of other free zones that weren't as uh, resounding success as Jebel Ali. The economic cities, for example, in Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah's economic city, these were announced in the mid 2000s. And the idea was to establish again, free zones, relax labor rules, relax uh, foreign capital rules, but they didn't take off. And one question I have is, is why did Jebel Ali succeed and King Abdullah's economic city didn't succeed? Was it just a question of luck that when King Abdullah city was, economic city was established uh, that it happened during the great financial crisis of 2008 and that never took off? Was it a question of, it was established outside traditional urban centers, um, whereas you know, Jabal Ali is much closer to Dubai, uh, Dubai center. Um, and that's obviously relevant given the context of NEOM and, and the new economic, uh, the new free, free zones that are being established today. Was it just a question of bad planning? Was it a question of bad luck? Uh, was it a question of free zones? Yes, there are pockets that are immune from the laws of the rest of the land, but they still need that. Uh, you need, still need an infrastructure, physical and uh, human infrastructure for them to succeed, for people to come, for people to work there, for companies to establish a place there. And I think that's a question um, that is worth asking and to think about, especially in the context of the new free zones that are being established and proliferating across the GCC. Finally, I want to talk about um, the recent events and the future of free zones in the context of free events, of recent events, sorry. Uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing increasing economic competition in the Gulf. We're seeing that Saudi has an ambitious uh, project, that project of diversifying the economy is targeting similar sectors to the ones that the UAE is targeting and Qatar is targeting and Bahrain is targeting, namely, and Oman, logistics, financial centers, and mega airport, tourism. We're seeing uh, more muscular steps. We've seen that Saudi Arabia has announced that any foreign company that needs to that wants to operate in the kingdom needs to establish a regional headquarter in Saudi Arabia by 2024. We've seen the announcement last week where, uh, tar where tariffs were applied to goods that are produced in free zones. 
And I think the direction of travel that we are moving into and the equilibrium that we're settling towards is uh, an equilibrium in which you have, within each country, you have more relaxed rules. We've seen a relaxation of foreign ownership laws, maybe some relaxation of labor laws in certain countries, but across countries and across borders, especially across the GCC, we're seeing more restrictions imposed across borders. And I think we're settling into an equilibrium, or we might be end up settling towards an equilibrium in which we have a more sort of open domestic economies, but more restrictions uh, across uh, borders. And the question is, what is the future? How do free zones operate in this new equilibrium? And how do they survive in this new equilibrium? And how do their business model change or alter within the context of this new equilibrium? So let me conclude with this question and I'll stop here and hand over to Sanam. Thank you, Ziad. You you definitely raise an important question on uh, these f future dynamics and, and how um, all of the states um, and uh, will adjust uh, to this equilibrium that you describe. And 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 thank you particularly for bringing up um, the issue of. Uh, uh, what seems to be very clear uh, competitive dynamics between the UAE and Saudi. That's definitely something that we have to dig into in the Q&A. Um, alongside also, I think, uh, the issue of uh, NEOM um, and lessons learned uh, perhaps from the past. I'm, I'm going to come back to you maybe uh, with those questions. I'm going to take the liberty of being a moderator and, and maybe ask one or two questions of my own before we turn uh, to those of the panel, uh, the participants who I know um, are, are pouring questions into the chat and, and please keep them coming. Uh, I, I promise uh, to make every effort to get to them. Um, but let me just um, turn to you or turn back to you, Robert, uh, and ask you um, a question. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, free zones around the region and, and the UAE is really, you know, sort of considered the gold standard um, of, you know, free zone success and, and Ziad uh, clearly pointed to that as well. Um, what are sort of the other competitive or um, um, uh, other free zones in, in the um, GCC uh, that we should be looking at and, and keeping um, an eye out for? Um, and what, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the competition, but um, what free zones are actually collaborative? Collaborating with each other is that a phenomenon? Is there collaboration among free free trade zones? Is that solely taking place perhaps within the UAE, or um, is, is there uh, intra GCC free zone uh, collaboration as well? Great. Uh, well, let me start. Uh, let me start with the second question first, and then make my way back to uh, to your first question. I think in terms of, of competition, the UAE is actually or the question of whether there's more cooperation or competition, the UAE is a good place to start. Um, I would say that one of the biggest issues with uh, regional free zones is that there tends to be more competition than cooperation. And I mean, we see this playing out in the UAE. The UAE is one country, although it has a federal structure built into the constitution is a certain degree of economic autonomy and free zones have been an important way for individual emirates in the UAE to assert that um, certain degree of economic autonomy and be able to control the types of business activities, the types of reg regulations that unfold within their borders. In the UAE, you do see some examples, some bodies that do try to create a certain degree of cohesiveness to, of cooperation. The Dubai Free Zone Council, for example, is one, is one example. But you don't necessarily see a similar body playing out on a federal level, i.e., um, you know, fostering collaborations, um, you know, on a, on a broad based level across the country. And what happens is in the lack of that type of mechanism, you see a number of industries having this massive proliferation of free zones in one country. I mean, at one point, there were several media free zones in the UAE. I think there, there still are to a degree. One or two of them have, have not met with, uh, with wonderful success, in, especially in the Northern Emirates. We, the Ratz al Khaimah free zone um, you know, was, was a short-lived free zone, the Ratz al Khaimah media free zone. We see more successful examples in Dubai, Dubai Media City, the 2454 in Abu Dhabi in the capital Emirate. And, and, and other Emirates across the country have a number of media free zones. But 
you do have to ask the question, does one country need, you know, several different media free zones? Is there perhaps room for better collaboration coordination here? And of course, that being said, there are media free zones as well in, um, you know, across the region too, not just in the UAE. So uh, that's, a, I mean, I'll leave it there in terms of collaboration, cooperation. I think now more than ever, um, there is a need for more collaboration between the region's free zones, both within countries, because even within countries, you see a number of different public-private partnerships um, competing against fully government-owned free zones. And this is what has actually played out in neighboring Oman. Um, so I'll move the conversation to Oman because the, the book on covers Gulf Arab free zones. It's not just a story about UAE free zones. And I think there are a lot of very interesting uh, free zone developments going on in Oman, in Qatar. Uh, in also, um, if we can believe these reports uh, coming out of Saudi Arabia, you know, in the future as well, in, in Saudi Arabia. So in Oman, uh, we saw uh, certain free zones having uh, private partnerships, bringing in multinational firms to manage free zones. The government's very interested in doing that. They want to have big multinational companies involved in the free zones. But the problem is um, when these multinationals uh, join as partners in free zones, as they have it, the Sohar port and free zone um, in the kind of northern uh, part of Oman, closer to the, the UAE border, um, these free zones with private partners actually end up competing with some of the government owned free zones. And a lot of the officials will complain and say, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we joined as a private partner, we're helping out, we're, you know, bringing FDI and, and um, you know, helping the reputation here but we're competing against other free zones that offer much more attractive benefits in other parts of the country. So how can we, you know, this doesn't really make sense. So I, I do think that this is a big issue. It's not just playing out in the UAE, it's happening in Oman. Um, and there are other interesting developments going on in the region. Qatar, for example, a couple of years back, rebranded um, some of its special economic zones as free zones. They created a new Qatar Free Zones Authority, and they're making a big push to um, fit these free zones next to air, their airport and their port with kind of um, fully uh, automated and high tech uh, machinery and services. So, you know, this is going to be something to watch. Qatar is a small place, but they have uh, the, the government has financial resources to make their free zones, um, you know, very cutting edge and competitive. And I think um, you know, that's that's going to, if anything, heighten the competitive dynamics between free zones in the region. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rob. I, I mean, one would just, what springs to mind is why they don't specialize. Um, each country takes a certain issue or industry and specialize their free zone so that the co competitive dynamics uh, are, are somewhat uh, diminished. But, um, you know, that speaks to sort of wider GCC trends that I'm sure we're going to uh, get to. Uh, Ziad, let me ask you a quick question before uh, we get to the Q&A. And I'm going to actually weave in uh, a question um, from uh, Matteo Legrenzi as well. I mean, he's asking um, if if you can elaborate on the future of free zones in Saudi Arabia um, and if they're still relevant in the context of Vision 2030, um, or is the idea to make all of Saudi Arabia into a free zone, at least in business terms? And let me add to that, and, and sort of you can uh, cherry pick if you want, um, since you brought up um, uh, Neom, um, and and we we know that there have been a number of, of past examples of, of not very successful um, economic cities, uh, not just in the kingdom, but around uh, the GCC. What are some of the lessons learned? Uh, you know, what is the kingdom doing differently this time on Neom uh, to uh, sort of guarantee its success? Or, you know, um, are you already seeing um, some uh, sort of red flags on the horizon with regards to Neom? Um, so for the, on the first question, the role of free zones within Vision 2030, um, they're quite central. Um, obviously, NEOM is fairly central in Vision 2030, is a very prominent project. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's highly, um, uh, you know, central to the vision. And Rob in the book quotes, uh, you know, parts from Vision 2030 on the role of free zones within that. And NEOM is uh, a very central part of that. And the concept free zone as, you know, a place where you relax local rules, uh, where you relax, relax local laws, uh, where you don't impose uh, as strict uh, nationalization ratios, uh, where you try to attract foreign uh, capital is definitely very, 
prominent in, in the project of NEOM. Um, your point on, on the specialization, uh, I think it goes beyond uh, the, you know, why doesn't each GCC, GCC country specialize in a particular sector rather than competing for the same thing? I think that goes beyond the um, free zones. Um, I think the world can, uh, you can produce, there are more than six sectors in the world that you can specialize in. Um, and, and basically they're getting the same advice about, you know, targeting the same sectors. Um, and, you know, naturally that means uh, they cannibalize each other's uh, market share. Um, now on the question of what is being done differently and what is being done uh, what is different and what is similar to to, to past experiences. Uh, I think I'll give an answer and I'll, I'll actually wanted to ask Rob a question as well. So the answer is, I think we need to be very careful. If your historical experience with large projects and with mega projects isn't so successful, I think you should just uh, tread very carefully and in small steps and they tend to pay off a lot better and a lot more than mega projects that are uh, more risky. Um, and they can, be, you know, they can generate big payoffs, but they can also generate big risks as well. Um, the question I actually had to Rob, which is basically uh, on the question of collaboration and cooperation. I mean, you're seeing the reason, one of the reasons why free zones are proliferating now is because the experience in Dubai and in other Northern Emirates was successful. So my question is, are the new free zones, that ones you mentioned in Oman and in Qatar and possibly in Saudi and other places, are they merely replicating exactly the same thing, the, the, the Dubai experience in these countries and trying to bring business to these countries? Or are they trying to do something slightly different? Are they trying to take it to the next level? Uh, thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to try to answer that and then tie it into also the question that Sanam asked you and, and maybe tick off one or two of the questions because I think it loops into some questions our audience has. Um, I mean, in short, no, I, I don't think all of the free zones we see in the region are a replication of the Dubai model. Many of them are. Uh, and I think in, in many cases, some of the early initiatives that we that we have seen emerge in Saudi Arabia over the past few years, kind of from 2016 onward, in many cases, was an attempt to take the, the, the biggest and the best parts of the UAE's free zone experience and apply it to a Saudi context. You know, there are other countries like Oman, for example, that in some cases, I think Omani officials realized they were never going to recreate the Dubai, you know, a Dubai model in Oman, that they had to focus on other niche areas and really leverage their comparative advantage. So you see a free zone popping up, for example, in Salala, um, in, you know, in the, uh, along the southern coast, a deep water port. Um, lots of government, um, you know, commitments and effort and sustained efforts um, to develop the Dokum special e economic zone. Um, that you know was really uh, there was a lot of interest there. There was hopes that the Chinese would invest uh, billions of dollars in that initiative. That those kind of hopes have fallen flat and, and are at least stalled at the moment, or we can say they're stalled. Um, but there was a hope, especially when uh, things were getting very tense around uh, the Strait of Hormuz, that this new uh, Dokum special economic zone would be uh, a savior for the Omani economy, that um, there would be a lot of, uh, of traffic, both commercial and otherwise, moving uh, through this port and free zone uh, and avoiding, in many instances, uh, the Strait of Hormuz. So, uh, I mean, I think in some examples, we do see the replication of, of the Dubai model. Uh, and there's a lot of good reason for that. But in other cases, um, I think policymakers in other countries have quite rightly come to the realization that replicating the model and trying to create, you know, uh, the uh, Dubai in, in different contexts, but be they Saudi, be they Omani or Qatari, doesn't really make a, a lot of sense. And I think to get to your point that, that you asked earlier is why have some of the economic cities in Saudi Arabia not had the same success that uh, free zones in Dubai have had? Well. You mentioned timing. I think timing is, is up there. Um, a lot of the economic cities in Saudi Arabia were announced right before the global financial crisis. Not a great time uh, to launch major investment initiatives requiring billions and billions of dollars of investments. That's the second point, that these, free zone, that these uh, economic cities in Saudi Arabia were standalone projects needed to be built from the ground up and required billions of dollars. Um, you don't see that in Dubai. In Dubai, what they did, I mean, Jebel Ali is a major uh, investment initiative 
was started quite early. But most of the free zones in Dubai took the successful parts of other free zones and replicated them. So you have the same uh, companies that created free zones, creating new free zones. So this wasn't new to them. This wasn't a new project. This was, okay, we have a blueprint, we have a model, let's create a handful more focused on different niche industries. And these free zones were integrated, as you said, into an existing a commercial environment that was on the map, that people knew about, people wanted to live in, people wanted to visit. So you didn't face the uphill battle of trying to bring people out uh, to a you know, new location. Um, and I already mentioned the proven model element. So I think there are a lot of um, there are a lot of takeaways that that one can um, can gather from the from the Dubai experience. Getting back to to Sanam's point, or getting back to this um, competition versus uh, cooperation element within the free zones themselves, there is kind of an evolution of the growth of free zones. So we see when free zones are usually created, they have a narrow mandate. They focus on a particular industry. But as free zones grow, and as they, kind of, in many cases, they outgrow their mandate, and then you start to see firm, uh, free zones attracting firms outside of you know, this individual narrow industry focus of media, for example, and saying, well, we're going to open it up to firms from a number of different industries. Because ultimately, if a free zone uh, encounters a certain degree of success, they're generating those revenues from company registrations, from fees, from other services, they want to build on that success. And that's when you get these free zones that outgrow their mandate, start uh, spilling over into other industries. And that you know, very dynamic can start to create this competitive dynamic, even within free zones that otherwise, and these are free zones, almost all are government owned within a particular emirate or within a particular com uh, country. These government entities, they should be cooperating, but in many cases, they aren't. They're actually competing for, uh, for trade and investment flows. And I mean, it makes sense when you look at it, but uh, in, in depth. But if you're kind of briefly looking at it in passing, it's, it sometimes can be a little bit, uh, a little bit confounding. Thank you both. Um, let me just ask you: there are a couple more questions on the UAE Saudi dynamic. I, you know, it's obviously um, very um, prominent in the news. Uh, so let's just dig in one more last, one more time. Um, for a bit more on um, why Saudi has put uh, tariffs um, on free zone products, is there do you see a rationale for it? Um, and does that mean that Riyadh itself may play, place less emphasis on developing new free zones in the future, given the possibility of retaliation? Um, could either of you or both of you say something on that? Why don't I just uh, I'll kick it off? I think. Um, yeah, the, the, this tariff issue is, is an interesting one. Um, I think in some respects, some of the coverage has made this issue into something into, um, has exaggerated the issue into something that, that it really isn't. And, and I'll explain why. I mean, first and foremost, the role or the position of free zones within um, bilateral free trade agreements. So if Oman wants to create, wants to finalize this uh, free trade agreement with the US, for example or within GCC-wide um, trade frameworks, economic frameworks, like the common market. Free zones have always occupied a, a somewhat of a gray area. I mean, they've been controversial. So how do you integrate free zones into these agreements? In what cases um, are goods and services from free zones actually considered um, local goods and services, or are they considered, considered coming from the offshore? In most cases, I mean, the general thrust in, you know, this doesn't apply. There are a lot of nuances here. It depends on the good, depends on how much you know, value added. It depends on when and where it enters um, the, the GCC. But in most cases, a traditional offshore, uh, a traditional free zone with a uh, bonded, demarcated area um, is technically considered outside of the GCC. It's considered an offshore entity. And when goods pass into the GCC from that free zone, um, they are subjected or supposed to be subjected to a 5% uh, tariff. So, I mean, I think there are two ways of looking at this um, recent kind of policy enforcement or a tweaking of regulations, however you want to look at it. Uh, I think on one end, you could say Saudi Arabia is getting stricter enforcing an existing policy. And this is going to push UAE officials to clarify what types of business activities that go on in free zones are actually happening onshore and offshore because some free zones have dual license. I and mean, there are firms that are in free zones that are onshore, have an onshore license and have an offshore license. 
There are some free zones that are not clearly bonded areas you can walk in and out of, like the DIFC. So, I mean, there is some room, I think, to clarify um, what activities are taking place offshore, what activities are taking place onshore. And in the meantime, I think what Saudi Arabia is trying to do here with the strategy is say, okay, we're going to force the UAE to get a little bit um, to clarify some of these issues. In the meantime, um, we're going to collect uh, tariffs um, and there's some actual you know, fiscal benefit here. Uh, I should say, by the way, that this has happened in the past, that this is not the first time Saudi has gotten tough with one of its neighbors. It actually did so with Bahrain um, several years ago. Bahrain has a, a, a Bahrain International Bis um, a BIIP um, and a Bahrain Logistics Zone two um, entities that at first were marketed as free zones. And when companies in those free zones started exporting their goods to Saudi Arabia, customs officials said, okay, you're coming from a free zone. Um, there's a 5% tariff. And the Bahraini officials said, oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. We're, these are local goods, local origin, GCC, um, you know, uh, freedom of movement for people and goods. And ultimately, the Bahrainis decided that it was in their interest to rebrand these entities to back down essentially and say these are not free zones make the necessary regulatory tweaks and say they are they are these are onshore business hubs so i mean th this move does have some precedence um but i think it comes at a time when a lot of us realize there are rising regional tensions um, and, and a certain degree of uh, regional competition so the timing of it is is i think perhaps more interesting than the actual uh, substance I think that's a really good point. Um, of course, uh, uh, we've been witnessing sort of a cascade of, of issues between the UAE and Saudi. And so, if, uh, you know, much of our speculation uh, could very well be uh, building on that. Uh, Ziad, did you want to jump in quickly? Or can I add a, a, just one more thing to your response list, if you don't mind? Because um, I am trying to get through the, uh, many of the interesting questions. Um, how do you see the concept of commercialized rents in relation to Gulf sovereign wealth fund? Sovereign wealth wealth funds um okay so commercialized rents is is uh something robert wrote about and theorized about in, in his book so i'll leave that theoretical concept to him um i think i'll just say one thing on rents from not necessarily commercialized but rents from sovereign wealth funds i think one idea behind the establishment of sovereign wealth funds and growing the sovereign wealth funds is to try and get return from these investment funds that would partially replace oil rents. So again, you're trying to generate revenue for the government outside taxes, which are politically expensive, and to generate that from rent that comes from a sovereign wealth fund as opposed to oil. Now, on the question uh, of the um, of of uh, the tariff imposition of tariff on 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 free zones, um, everything you said is is valid. The Points that Rob mentioned are definitely valid and worthwhile. But as you've mentioned, Sanam, there is, there is a, a context to this, and the context is increased regional competition. We saw that with the Saudi decision to asking companies to move their regional headquarters to Riyadh by 2024. We saw that in the unusually, very unusually, public disagreement in OPEC+. Plus. And coincidentally, that, 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 that law came up around the same time as that public disagreement in OPEC+. Plus. So there is this sort of regional economic competition that's taking place. And I think the other thing that I would note is, is what is happening to sort of GCC um, economic integration. Uh, it has taken some blows. You know, the, the tariff decision is one. The Qatar boycott a few years ago was another. The staggered uh, introduction of VAT uh, is supposed to be uniform, is supposed to happen in every single country at the same time. We've had the UAE and Saudi applying in 2018, Bahrain later, Oman this year, uh, Qatar yet to happen, Kuwait is, I don't know what's happening there. So again, these, these factors are telling us that that economic integration of the GCC is taking many blows. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the equilibrium to think about in the future. Thank you, uh, Ziad. Um, Robert, in in take, taking us back to commercialized rents, um, could you? There are two questions I think that are somewhat uh, related. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on the future of uh, free trade zones in the region? Um, do you see an eventual end? Is you know, are, are the removal of restrictions on foreign investment sort of 
foreshadowing the end of free trade zones? Where do you see this going? Sure. On the so first on the commercialized rent uh, point, and uh, thanks, Yad. I was curious for you to take a stab at the at the concept that I put out in the book, but um, you know, I certainly understand why you'd want me to do it. Uh, look, we could talk all day about about rents. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, rents are a reward uh, for the ownership of natural resources. But more than that, I mean, rents are represent income that derive from selling goods and services significantly above their production costs. So. You can look at a, a number of different rent sources um, that are taking plot, place across the region or that you, you can observe across the region. I, of course, wanted to introduce this concept um, at, you know, rents as they pertain to free zones, precisely because there is a whole narrative to say that, you know, that free zones are completely separate from some of the economic structures and the, the dependence on hydrocarbon resources. And I think you know, there's, there's some truth to that, but at the same time, if we pick apart free zones, how the free zones generate revenue, we can actually see a lot of the same types of economic structures that have emerged around, um, you know, econ economic activities associated with um, oil and gas, you know, the hydrocarbon, um, hydrocarbon related industries. Um, so I wanted to, to say that, yes, this is a, a new development, but it's not entirely separate development. And why, you know, commercialized rents or how commercialized rents, those revenues from free zones, would be different from revenues from a sovereign wealth fund, for example. Well, I mean, the source of revenues is, is ultimately different. A lot of the, um, I mean, first and foremost, a lot of the revenues or the, the assets in sovereign wealth funds are coming from proceeds uh, from, from oil and gas exports, number one. So the source of revenues is very different. In free zones, free zones are generating revenues predominantly from uh, real estate leasing, um, real estate and uh, firm registration and a number of different affiliated services connected to, um, to, uh, to free zone firms. Um, also, I think more importantly, and I, and I pick apart this in my book, so I would probably um, not go into too much depth here, but there are so many different elements of, like, of rent seeking that you can identify around free zones that are not necessarily applicable to uh, sovereign wealth funds or even to you know, oil and gas industries. I mean, just think about the types of people who fill, um, you know, seats in free zone bureaucracies, the types of uh, firms that are encouraged and uh, persuaded to set up headquarters or set up um, operations within a free zone, what type of commercial incentives and, you know, um, are offered to these, uh, to these uh, investors and firms in order to attract them into the free zones. I mean, there are just a number of different ways that make uh, this type of rents um, very distinct and very interesting to look at in isolation. And that's why I wanted to, to, to kind of create a new typology of rents, or at least elaborate. I didn't create it. It was there, but to elaborate on, on this different form of rents. Um, what, so now, I mean, the future of free zones, I mean, my, the last chapter of my book says, um, is titled The Fraught Future of Free Zones. So it's, it's not entirely rosy. I do think there are a certain there was a certain arm of free zone growth that is unsustainable, um, and I mentioned a little bit about this. Do you really need several different media free zones in one country, in one relatively small country? I'm not sure about that. Um, there already have there are examples of a closure um, in one of these free zones. I think we will see some free zones, you know, living out their mandate, essentially finding some way to be absorbed into another existing entity. But why do I think that there will always be a place for free zones, at least for the foreseeable future? Well, it comes down to regulatory consistency. We're talking here about regulations changing, new foreign ownership laws, new labor, um, new regulations around labor market, markets, new taxes and fees. Foreign firms, multinationals, they like consistency. They don't want things changing week to week, month to month, day to day. Even if some of those changes um, herald you know, improvements in the short term, they're, gonna, they're thinking long term. They're going to set up a firm, uh, commence operations in a new country, you want regulatory consistency. You want to be able to project, um, you know, your business operations, costs and risks uh, for the, you know, over the long term. So I think many free zones in the region are in a very strong position, especially the more established ones to say, hey, we have this regulatory consistency. We have big multinationals that have trusted us for decades, or at least for, you know, for, for many, many years. Um, you know, and that's a very strong um, proposition to make. 
Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our time, but I wanted to squeeze in two more questions if possible. Um, they're they're um, connected at least uh, because we're you know turning outwards and thinking about how free zones are um, promoting uh, trade with uh, ex external countries outside of the GCC. And you know, if either of you or actually both of you really um, could reflect on um, the impact and effect that uh, the Abraham Accords uh, will have on uh, Dubai free trade zones and for the UAE more broadly. Um, and at the same time, um, if you have any thoughts on how um, important India, China and other uh, rising um, economies are for the future of free trade zones um, across the GCC and will will smaller free trade zones like uh, Fujairah free, Z free trade zone uh, shut shop due to increased competition. There was also a, a, a question about Kuwait's free trade zones, not really, um, uh, we, you know, we're short on time, but if you want to sort of comment on, on where Kuwait is um, in this story, that would also um, be welcome. Uh, Ziad, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so I think what um, all these questions have in common is um, is, is as follows. Uh, Rob's book is called The Political Economy of Free Zones in Gulf Arab States. I think these questions are about the geopolitical economy of free zones in the Gulf Arab States. Um, I think free zones will face, um, they, they were a great neat solution to what happened, uh, you know, to the, to the political economy of the, of, of the GCC in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. But I think they're facing new sort of uh, challenges ahead. Uh, one of them is what all these questions have in common, which is basically the external environment. The rise of China, the growth of India, the uh, uh, peace uh, accord with Israel, and how, how they would cope with that. The erection of more sort of restrictions on trade within the GCC, the tariffs, on free zone products. Again, because a lot of them are outward looking, a lot of them are export oriented. It's a question of how they face that challenge. Um, I think they're also facing a domestic challenge, which is basically in each country that liberalizing foreign ownership laws, which means that if you're a company and you wanna set up in one of the GCC countries and you have a choice between setting up onshore versus in a free zone, the only benefit you have in the free zone, assuming that these foreign ownership laws are applied widely, is basically the labor laws. You don't have to hire as many nationals as you have outside. But again, that comes at a cost because free zones, as, as Rob has mentioned, through commercialized rents, you have to pay fees that are higher than elsewhere and you have to have rents. You have to pay rents that are higher than elsewhere. And again, in the context of the rest of the economy is liberalizing, how do you survive and what competitive advantage do you have as a free zone to operate in that country? And I think all of these questions are, are the questions that the free zones have to think about. They're different to the challenges that they have come up against in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. But these are the questions that they need to face in the 2020s and 2030s um, and an environment where also all prices are going to be declining in the long term. Thanks, Yad. I mean, I know we're we're pushing up against the end here, but I'll just briefly mention three points: uh, Israel, China, and, and Kuwait. Uh, I mean, first, first, I should say it's it's a little too early to assess how this, uh, you know, the normalization agreements, the engagement between the UAE and Israel will impact free zones. But what we can say is that in the immediate aftermath of the normalization agreements, that free zones were pushed to the forefront of those commercial linkages. We saw DMCC. Um, Jebel Ali Free Zone, I think the uh, DIFC, all signing um, agreements and uh, MOUs with counterparts in Israel. So at the very least, we at least saw a concerted effort to push these commercial entities at the forefront of those relations. Um, I mentioned in my previous comments a little bit why I think they are uh, well positioned to, to do that. Um, the second point on China, if you want to understand or if you'd like to understand how China is engaging with the region, from an economic point of view, you should start by looking at major free zone hubs across the region. Uh, you can look at uh, Khalifa Industrial Zone, their free trade zone. There's a um, UAE China zone as part of that, a major initiative within that, uh, with that, in that free zone in Abu Dhabi. In Dukum, there were, you know, maybe not completely realized, but also China uh, has a aspirational footprint there. And in, in Dubai as well, the number of Chinese firms is, is growing. Uh, day by day in, in many of the free zones there. So 
if you want to, if if you're interested in China's presence, economic presence in the region, I would suggest starting with looking at what's going on in free zones across the region. And finally, with Kuwait, uh, Kuwait has ha, you know has a, num- a number of issues related to its free zones. I think that ultimately relates on a high level to political obstacles and, and inability for kind of politics gets in the way of business a lot in Kuwait. Uh, but also in Kuwait, um, their free zone that was created in the 1990s. Uh, the status was canceled ultimately because there was a disagreement between the private sector partner and the government. So it also goes to show that another point we didn't really get into today, but these entities themselves, the free zones across the region, these are government entities, even though most of the firms registered in free zones tend to be private sector firms. So they occupy this very interesting, I mean, they walk a fine line between um being hubs for private sector activity, but also being owned, regulated, and ultimately uh, controlled by the government. And I think Kuwait's a perfect example when sometimes when you bring the private sector interests together with public sector interests, it doesn't always work out. So I'll leave it there. And um, uh, I guess if there aren't any more questions, Sanam, do we have any? Uh, I think we're probably coming toward the end of our time. It might be upon me to uh, bring things to a close. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So great. I, I mean, I think we probably could have gone a lot longer. There's a lot more to say, but at least, you know, there's a whole book. So if you're interested, you can, you can read more. Um, and uh, I want to say just once again, thank you so much to, to both Sanam and, and Ziad for, for joining me and, and everyone who tuned in today as well. Um, you know, you can uh, learn a lot more about these topics and other topics pertaining to the Gulf, not just political economy issues, but issues uh, across the board on our website at www.agsiw.org. I encourage you to check out the website and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon at a, uh, you know, at an upcoming event. So thank you so much.